I... Yeah, we, I, I'm here to talk a little bit about probiotic skincare. I guess what you're seeing behind me is a very simplified version uh, of probiotic skincare. We're trying to explain to the consumer exactly what this is going to do for them. Uh, and it's not always easy to take a complicated story and push it into 44 seconds. But uh, we have launched the world's first live probiotic serum and I suppose that, I mean, that has certainly attracted attention and I guess I'll explain a little bit about why we did that. Uh, the company was formed in 2002. Uh, I'm a chemist, so I was doing research on pharmaceuticals from plants that were indigenous to Africa and we were taking actives from those plants and, and making new pharmaceuticals from them. And I found some of those that were applicable for anti-aging and I started the company based on those, on those ingredients. Um, uh, we're in the process of, sort of updating our, our line and uh, at the moment we're launching the S Plus line. Um, so that's the serum and it contains 1 billion live probiotic microbes. Uh, we're also busy pulling bio and plus technology throughout our line. Um, basically that includes prebiotics which favor good microbes, uh, probiotics that are uh, can actively change the, the, the ecology of skin. Um, pH balancing and we're certified, certified organic as well. Uh, the brand has expanded very quickly over the last while but uh, I'm not here to speak about the brand, I'm mostly here to speak about probiotic skin care. So just to get through a few definitions, uh, I'm really sorry I can't speak Swedish. <laughs> I speak Zulu and Afrikaans. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, so a, a microbe is a single-celled organism, uh, too small to see, and in one cubic meter there are two and a half million of them. So one cubic meter of air. So they're everywhere. You can't hide from them. They're part of you. But a microbe is a single-celled organism that's too small to see. So it could be a bacterium, it could be yeast, it could be a virus, it could be any one of about six different families. Your microbiome is all the microbes that live in and on you. It's the sum total of all those microbes. And a prebiotic is a food that favors good microbes. And a probiotic in food is very easy, uh, it's very easy to define. A probiotic in food is a microbe that is good for you that's alive and can form a colony. So in food, a, mi a probiotic has to be alive. So in yogurt, you'll see uh, an, adver an advert saying, oh, okay, these have live AB cultures. That means that those cultures are, those probiotics are alive and they can form colonies. In skincare, the definition of a probiotic is not quite so simple, but I'll get to that just now. So, this, is, uh, this understanding of a human being is quite new. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an evolution of egocentric thinking. So we used to think that the world was flat because that's the way it looked, but it, it's not, right? Uh, and we also used to think we were at the center of the universe because our egos are very strong. So when we look up and we see things moving around us, we assume we're at the center, but we're not. And when you look at a human being, the assumption immediately is that, well, I'm me, right? I, I, my ego says I'm one thing. But we're not. We're a mix of loads and loads of different species that are all working together to keep one thing going. So this new look at a human being as, as an ecosystem has completely changed health and skin care and will continue to change them over the next 10 years because these findings are very new. So, the, 
Human Microbiome Project uh, finished its first phase in 2013. And when I first read that, I mean, I'd been following this research and I still spent, it took some time to process for me. Microbes contribute more genes that are essential for human survival than humans do. So the bugs that live in and on me are doing more for my well-being than I am with my own cells. And that's, that's a fundamental shift in, in the way we understand being human. So there's an, there's an idea of how many genes humans contribute just versus the gut microbiome. I mean, you can see the amount we contribute are, is very, very small. Uh, where are these microbes? They're basically everywhere. Uh, they're in our blood, eyes, skin, lungs. We are basically dependent on microbes. So, how the hell did we find this out now? I mean, science has been rolling for some time now. We've had microscopes. What the hell? How did you miss this? So, uh, it, took, it took the Human Genome Project to finish before we could very clearly understand which parts of DNA were human and which parts were microbial. So, until the completion of the Human Genome Project, we didn't know which bits were which. Once, in 2004, when the Human Genome Project finished, it was immediately clear that the genome that we thought was going to be 2 million genes was only 23,000. And all the rest was microbial. So if you look at the lead researchers of the Human Genome Project, Craig Fenter was the guy that sequenced it. He got on a yacht and he went sampling bacteria in the ocean. Because he understood that for three and a half billion years, there were only microbes on this planet. We're a very recent addition. Microbes set the rules for multicellular life, all multicellular life. So when the first time that cells started joining up to form larger organisms, they did so in the presence of microbes, and microbes mediated a lot of that. So as soon as the Human Genome Project had finished, the human microbiome basically started, and in 2013, the Human Microbiome Project came up with the famous quote that you'll start seeing more and more. Uh, it did a... Thanks. Uh, that there are 10 microbes for every human cell in your body. So, you know, if there was a vote, we'd lose. It's, uh, it's an interesting stat, and it's clear that they're going to form a large part of, uh, of, our, of our makeup. So, human beings in ecology, and we're a harmonious mix of microbes in human cells. So what does that mean? It means that we can start taking some of the learnings, some of the things that we found out about m large scale ecologies, and we can start applying them to health and skin care. So diversity is a good thing. In a diverse ecology, you'll have some species that can handle droughts, you can have, ha have some species that will handle higher temperatures, you'll have uh, other species that can handle low temperatures. You have this diverse mix of species that when the environment changes they can adapt quite quickly. That's a strong ecosystem. A weak ecosystem is when you have one or two species. Any change in the environment heavily influences those few species and you don't want that. So look at our thinking over the last while and we've had an us versus them thing, a way of thinking. And it, 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 we've basically waged war on our microbes. We've tried to kill them with antibiotics and sanitizers. We've spent ages trying to isolate our children from these things as well. It's not healthy. You want diversity, you need diversity in your, in your microbial ecosystem. So, for me, this was pretty bad news. Uh, I read the first 
findings from the Human Microbiome Project. And I, I'm a chemist. I'm, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in, in extracting from plants single active molecules that have an effect on a human being. But I've just found out that this human being isn't a human being anymore, it's an ecology. And every time you take a single molecule and you apply it to an ecology, you have a very good short-term result, and then you have chaos. So when we first took DDT and we applied it to an ecology to kill mosquitoes, we had a great result, all the mosquitoes died, and then we had chaos, all sorts of unintended consequences. And I think a lot of the time in skin and healthcare, we're seeing the same sort of thing. There's great <coughs> crisis management, but not much long-term thinking, not much long-term ecological placement of species. So I basically had to relearn uh, a lot of what I thought I knew. Um, this is just an example of, because uh, I mean probiotics are clearly more uh, well publicized for gut health than they are for skin. This gives you some idea of where the micro microbial diversity in your body lies. So 29% in your gut, a very large percent in your oral and esophagus, 21% um, on skin, and these numbers vary by individual. Um, airways, I mean your lungs are really, I mean they're full of microbes, and as a matter of fact you're dependent to some extent on a fungus that grows in your lungs to process the oxygen. So you can see there's nowhere that's basically, basically nowhere that's microbe free, uh, your blood, your eyes. The one place that is mostly microbe free is in the membrane inside the fluid that surrounds your brain and spinal column. And the other place, most importantly, that is microbe free to some extent, uh, is in the membrane that surrounds a growing child. So as long as that membrane is intact, that child hasn't met microbes yet. But as soon as that membrane bursts, that's that child's first introduction to microbes. So we're always taught that you can't change your genes, but what if the majority of your genes aren't yours? If we have 360 times more bacterial genes in our bodies than we have humans, human genes, then maybe we can shift those genes and we can have a long-term beneficial effect on human beings. So this is just to show the effects that some practices have. And uh, this is Sweden, so perhaps the caesarean section rate is quite low here. But that's not the case in countries that have privatized healthcare. In privatized healthcare, countries like the US um, and even China with its one, one child policy, we have very, very high levels of caesarean section. So here you can see, uh, this is taken from a two week old child uh, and it's the cheek skin microbiome. So look at the lactobacillus, that's the blue. On a normal birth child, you have massive dominance of lactobacillus. Look at the caesarean section child and you'll see a tiny percentage of lactobacillus. So, the story begins about five days before birth. As the mother starts preparing for birth, and this has got nothing to do with mental preparation, your body knows its own thing. The microbiology in the birth canal starts to change completely. So, five days before, the pH starts dropping and the mother starts heavily favoring lactobacillus. This is to seed that child's skin with the correct microbes as it leaves. So as it enters the world, it already has the correct microbes seeded on its skin. Why is this important? It's because those are the microbes that are going to stay there. Those microbes, that first micro, those first microbes that colonize, colonize deep into skin and stay there. So this is the same child at age 20. Look at lactobacillus, still massively dominant on the normal birth child, and you see about 10 times less lactobacillus on the, on the caesarean section child. 
So when you look at cesarean section children, they're three times more likely to have eczema, they get allergies. So it's a major impact to your long-term microbial setup. So that child's had its skin well seeded with good microbes. What's happening to its gut? So during the physiological stress of giving birth, the mother is able, and nobody knows how this is done yet, but the mother is able to transport microbes from her gut into that first drink of milk. So in the first drink of milk, the child's getting its first dose, very high dose, of probiotic microbes. That's another thing that gets short-circuited by elective C-section. Because if you're having your baby at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning so that the doctor can make golf in the afternoon, then you want to be sure that you, you don't get the opportunity to move those microbes around. So the, the richness, the diversity of the microbes that are seeded for that child's gut are, is very, very low in comparison. In that first drink of milk, there's also uh, a third of the... Of, of that first drink of milk is a prebiotic. So the mother is going to great lengths to feed this child's microbes. This is just an idea of how deep into the, into the skin the microbes go. So a lot of people have the misconception that on the surface is where the microbes lie and that's not the case at all. You can see that the diversity actually increases as you get deeper and deeper into skin. So your skin's an ecology, there's no doubt about it. Uh, here you see two skin cells, keratinocytes, uh, that's the nucleus, these are the microbes, and they're docked onto, this, onto the cell membrane of that, of that skin cell. It used to be thought that the, what the skin cell was doing, because we had this us versus them idea, it used to be thought that what the skin cell was doing is binding that microbe and killing it. It actually turns out that what's happening is that skin cell is using that microbe as a little chemistry factory. Uh, there's a long-term relationship between these things and basically what happens is your skin cell pushes starting materials out. The microbe does the conversion and gives and gets some energy out of the deal and gives the skin, the skin cell what it needs out of the, out of the reaction. So, What's happening is your skin cell doesn't have the genes to do some chemistry and it outsources that chemistry to microbes. So what do we think about when we're building a product around the skin microbiome? We have to think about pH. Your body works really hard to keep the pH at around four and a half or five in your, on your skin. It does this because at low pH, you limit the number of microbes that can grow. So the microbes that grow at low pH are more likely to help your skin cells than the chaos that happens at pH 7. At pH 7, anything can grow. At low pH, you can at least squeeze the correct microbes in. So we pH, obviously pH balance all of the products, in particular the moisturizers that stay on. The oils that you use are really important, so if your skin has been producing oil all along and has been uh, allowing the microbes on, in, in and on the skin to convert those oils into energy, then surely you want to mimic those oils as best you can so that you don't disturb the ecosystem. If you take a petrochemical oil though and use that instead, what happens is you see a, there's no nutrient in a chemical oil. So what happens is there's a drop in the total number of microbes. Your skin, however, is getting told, hey, there's plenty of oil, stop producing. So there's a drop in the amount of oil. Now the whole system is basically running like a desert. So you take what was a flourishing ecosystem and you drop the total numbers of microbes. Then when you stop using the product, there's chaos because all of a sudden there's lots of energy because your skin starts producing oil again and then it takes a while for the ecosystem to normalize. 
Another thing that we pretty much always use is our prebiotics. So I'll talk a little very quickly about that just now. And uh, the preservative system is very important because those preservatives are killing microbes in the product. It doesn't matter whether it's an organic product or any product. What if there's a preservative system it's busy killing microbes in the product? So we consider very carefully how that preservative system will impact on the microbes when, it, when that product is used. And we use a two-part preservative system and one part is volatile, so it evaporates off and then the whole system works, uh, works okay for the skin microbiome. And then we use probiotics, but I just want to go through quickly what that might mean. So what's this going to do for skin? I think first we need to just quickly define what a probiotic is. How long do I have? We're okay. Cool. Um, so in skincare, there isn't regulation of the term probiotic. In food, there is. Food, it has to be alive and it has to be able to form a colony. In skincare, we've seen four different levels of probiotics. On, in level one, uh, they take a nutrient broth. So that, this is the way you grow probiotics. They take a nutrient broth and they let the probiotics grow. Then they filter the, mi the microbes off. So the probiotic microbes are filtered off and they use the soup that's left behind as a probiotic ingredient in skincare. Now that's, that's fairly common uh, and you can get good results that way. It's, we, don't, we choose not to call that a probiotic though. Uh, we feel that you need to use the microbe itself. At level two, they take the nutrient broth. They put the microbes in and let them grow. They filter the, mi the soup off. And then they take the microbes and they break them. They use ultrasound or, uh, or bead beaters to break the microbes. And then they use the juice from inside those microbes. So that they use the cytoplasm. We use level two quite a lot. Um, it's a convenient way to get uh, probiotic products into um, into uh, relatively normal formulations that the consumer can work with. We can get really good results out of level two, but it depends on which, uh, on, on, on what type of skin you're using it on. Level three, we haven't seen many brands using this at all. I actually haven't seen any yet. So in level three, what happens is you take your nutrient broth, you add the mi microbe, the probiotics, and you let them grow. And then you heat that mixture to 60 degrees and cool it over three days. So you heat to 60, cool, heat to 60, cool. And what you end up with is whole microbes, but they're dead. Okay, they can still dock onto a skin cell, but they, they can't replicate. So we can still use those, and we do use that level quite a lot. We call those two levels probiotic extracts because we feel that probiotics should be a live microbe that can form a colony. So level four, uh, we have one product that has level four probiotics. When we've used three different species of skin microbes to be able to change uh, the ecology on skin. And those microbes are alive. We have one billion per milliliter and they can shift the skin's ecology. So skin cells have docking spaces for, for microbes. Um, like I said, it, it used to be thought that that was to kill the microbe. It turns out that that's not the case. But there's competition for that space. So what will happen is if you don't get a good microbe in there, there's a reasonable chance that a bad microbe like Staphylococcus aureus or something nasty will dock onto that skin cell. If that happens, the, the lifespan of that skin cell decreases by half. So you want a good microbe on there so that the bad guy can't get in. This is what it looks like. So this is us adding prebiotic, I mean pro, uh, probiotic microbes. And if you get good coverage, then the, there's no space, there's no food, and there are no docking sites left for that bad guy. So that's the way you're probably